Hi everyone, welcome to the Great Salt Lake exhibit, where we're going to be learning more about how the lake has changed over time and its significance to modern life. But to start our explorations, we'll need to go back millions of years to the Pleistocene epoch. The Pleistocene lasted from 2.6 million years ago to 12,000 years ago. This epoch experienced the most recent ice age and features animals such as mammoths and mastodons. Along with these distinctive large land mammals, the Pleistocene hosted many species still alive today, such as some birds, mammals, flowering plants, and insects. The end of the Pleistocene saw the extinction of many large land mammals, such as the mammoths. To learn more about this topic, make sure to check out our videos from the Past Worlds exhibit. An important feature here in Utah during the Pleistocene was Lake Bonneville, an ancient lake that formed about 32,000 years ago. This lake was much larger than the modern Great Salt Lake. Lake Bonneville spanned about 325 miles in length, reaching into Idaho and down the western side of Utah to about Milford. It stretched out covering the West Desert and came all the way up here to the Natural History Museum of Utah. Here, we would be standing on the shores of the lake. You can see on the map here an outline of where the lake would have been compared to where we are today. Lake Bonneville was home to many animals, including fish, birds, and mammoths. Unlike the modern lake, Lake Bonneville was fresh water, not salt water. The lake was fed by precipitation, rivers and streams, and even melting glaciers. This fresh water was able to support a different scope of life than the salt water from the modern lake. Take a look out your window. What do you think your neighborhood looked like during the Pleistocene? So how did Lake Bonneville become the Great Salt Lake we all know today? Over thousands of years, Lake Bonneville experienced multiple flood events that broke through natural dams in Idaho, lowering the water level in the lake. Combined with this, Utah became warmer and drier than it was during the Pleistocene epoch. As climate changed, the lake experienced more evaporation and continued to shrink in size. As Lake Bonneville shrank, it left behind multiple remnants, including Utah Lake, Severe Lake, the Bonneville Salt Flats, and of course, the Great Salt Lake. The Great Salt Lake exists in the lowest depression of the Great Basin. The Great Basin is the watershed we live in that spans almost all of Nevada, much of Oregon and Utah, and parts of Idaho, California, and Wyoming. Due to the location of the Great Salt Lake in the lowest depression, it is a terminal lake, meaning that water flows into the lake, but no water flows out of the lake. This is what causes the lake's signature high salinity levels. All water has some salt, but fresh water typically has very little. The water flowing into the Great Salt Lake has very low salt levels, but as the water continues to evaporate from the lake, the salt level, or salinity, becomes more concentrated or higher. This high salinity creates a home for animals and plants with specific adaptations, such as salt grass and brine shrimp. Now you may be asking yourself if the lake has finished changing, and it isn't. The lake is constantly undergoing change and will continue to do so into the future as the industry changes around its banks and its climate change continues. Modern day changes can be observed by noticing the level of the lake. The most recent flood from the Great Salt Lake was in 1983, when there was so much water that some of the streets of Salt Lake City were turned into rivers. Another place to observe the water level changes is the spiral jetty. The spiral jetty is a land art by Robert Smithson created in 1970. Over the years, the lake level has sometimes covered the art piece, but right now it is above water and can easily be visited. Another way to see how the lake has changed over time is to look for the microbialites. Microbialites are large, bulbous, sedimentary rock formations created by blue and green algae. These formations used to be commonplace in environments millions of years ago, but now only grow in extreme environments, like the Great Salt Lake, due to grazing animals. Microbialites would not have existed in Lake Bonneville due to the fresh water. But the Great Salt Lake is the perfect home for microbialites to thrive in today because the high salinity levels decreases the number of other animals, plants, and algae that might compete for space or nutrients. Microbialites are one more piece of the puzzle that scientists study to understand the way our environment has changed over time. We're gonna explore more about life cycles in the lake. You know, there are no fish in Great Salt Lake, and some people think that there's nothing that lives here. But what does live in the Great Salt Lake? Many animals and plants call the Great Salt Lake home, but two very important creatures provide the foundation for the Great Salt Lake food web, brine shrimp and brine flies. Brine shrimp are one of the few animals that thrive in the Great Salt Lake's high salinity waters. These crustaceans are super tiny at about one fourth of an inch long. Full grown adults have exoskeletons with many moving small appendages. Hatching from tiny eggs called cysts Brine shrimp can be found in the lake from April to September. These eggs are so small that you could fit 150 on the head of a pin. 
In the Great Salt Lake, these eggs float on the surface until conditions are just right for hatching, usually in the spring when temperatures reach around 43 degrees Fahrenheit. One of the most amazing functions of these eggs is that they can lie dormant for months or even years until they are subject to the right conditions for hatching. During the summer months, the eggs are hatched within the females, who then give birth to live young called noplii. Before noplii becomes an adult, it must go through several molts where it sheds its exoskeleton and grows new features. In males, the adults form large frontal appendages for grasping onto females during mating. In females, they develop a large egg pouch located on their abdomen. These features make it easy to tell the difference between males and females just by looking closely. In the lake, brine shrimp feed on algae and bacteria. Brine shrimp also provide food for millions of migrating birds every year and are an important part of the Great Salt Lake ecosystem. Not only important for birds, brine shrimp also provide commercial shrimpers with billions of brine shrimp eggs, which are used as fish and prawn food. Much of this shrimp egg harvest is shipped internationally to fish farms and pet stores, making it a multi-million dollar industry and an important piece of the Utah economy. The other important creature living in the lake are brine flies. Billions of these flies populate the beaches around the lake during the summertime and provide food for millions of birds that use the Great Salt Lake as a migratory stop. These flies are much smaller than normal houseflies, at about one-fourth of an inch when they are fully grown. The eggs, larvae, and pupae are all strictly aquatic and they live their first three stages in the salt water. The first stage are little eggs that lie suspended in the salt water until conditions are just right, usually in the spring. Each female brine fly can lay about a hundred eggs at a time. From this stage, the eggs hatch and become tiny twitching larvae that swim throughout the Great Salt Lake, feeding on algae and dead brine shrimp. These larvae eventually develop little cases like cocoons that we call pupae or pupal cases. Throughout the brine shrimp life cycle, these first three stages are all in the salt water. It isn't until these pupal cases hatch into adult brine flies that they can escape to the surface of the lake in a tiny air bubble. The adults live for about three to four days along the beaches. If you've ever been to the Great Salt Lake, chances are you've seen clouds of brine flies and used pupal cases all along the beach. One amazing adaptation brine flies have is that they produce a waxy substance from their abdomen, which they then rub all over their bodies to make themselves waterproof. If the Great Salt Lake can teach us anything, it's to enjoy the small things in life. The Great Salt Lake provides a home for many other animals, including millions of birds. And the marshy wetlands that surround the Great Salt Lake provide the perfect nesting spot for many different bird species. And those brine flies and brine shrimp at the lake, the most delicious meal for birds and growing fledglings. Each year, about five million birds visit the Great Salt Lake. It's one of the largest migratory stopover zones in the world. The habitat at the lake is a vital part of survival for many of these bird species. What birds have you noticed outside? Let's learn about a few of my favorite birds that visit the Great Salt Lake. First up, the white-faced ibis. These birds have beautiful iridescent feathers, a long curved beak, and during the springtime, a white outline on their face. These birds live in the wetland areas of the Great Salt Lake and wade into the water to find their food. Their beaks are extra special because they have feeling in the tip of their beak, similar to the tips of your fingers. Can you make a beak with your fingers? Imagine poking around in the mud at the bottom of a pond to find your food. Can you feel it? Another one of my favorite birds is the great blue heron. This bird has long legs, a thick, sturdy beak, and gray-blue feathers. Herons also feed by wading into the water, but they have a very different technique than the white-faced ibis. Herons use a sneak attack. They stand still in very shallow water, waiting for a fish to swim by. And when it does, stab! The heron spears the fish on its beak. Try it with me. Everyone get their beak ready. Stand very still and watch the water. Wait, 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 a fish! Yum! I've saved one of my favorite birds for last, the eared grebe. This bird almost looks like a duck, but is a different species. In the springtime, eared grebes are mostly black with yellow feathers fanning out from a bright red eye. Like other grebes, the eared grebe has an elaborate courtship dance. It starts with a call, continues with dives underwater, feather fluffing, and a run on top of the water. Let's try part of that together. Okay, everyone. 
the one ring ready, now the other. Bow to your partner, dive underwater and pop up to dance on top of the water with your neck stretched out. Did you get that? Let's try it again all together. Wings tucked in, bow to your partner, dive underwater and pop up to dance. Very good, everyone. There are so many more birds to learn about at the Great Salt Lake and all around Utah. I hope that you continue to explore to see the amazing behaviors of animals and notice the ever-changing world around you. Thanks for joining me today.